So when I was in school, um, in order to get an A, there's a lot of things you had to do and accomplish. And um, I didn't do most of them, so I never received an A uh, until my junior year in high school. Um, you would think that I would have gotten an A in PE. Um, I managed somehow to not get an A in PE. And I think it was because the way you got an A was by doing two things, dressing out and showing up. No wonder I didn't get an A, all right? Because I, I oftentimes didn't show up and oftentimes I didn't have my clothes to change into. How many can relate to that at PE? Okay, all the middle and last borns, the first borns had their clothes every time. So, uh, so, and then when they got so stinky and smelly and crispy, because they were in your locker, you're not gonna put those on again, you know? And so I just wouldn't dress up. And, um, and I was such an emotional kid that emotions kind of determined whether I was gonna show up on that day for anything or not. Everything passed through that. So I didn't experience getting an A um, until my junior year. And I had a teacher, his name was Mr. Mungo. He taught free enterprise and he did a couple of things for me. The first thing he did was he said, hey Henry, fourth hour, you take, would you take the first five minutes of class and do stand-up comedy and then introduce me and I'll teach free enterprise. I'm like, yeah, because uh, up until then I'd been pretty much a comedic distraction. And so I'd get there, do the first five minutes, and then I'd say, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mungo, and he'd get up and he'd teach for Enterprise. And then I'd think something funny while he was talking, and he would stop me and say, save it for, you know, for tomorrow. Uh, this is my time, that's your time. Oh yeah, of course, jot it down. So he, he did something that was nobody ever done, he valued what I had been doing for years in class as the class clown, and he gave it a place. I didn't realize that's what he was doing. And he was able to teach without me interfering. And very creative. The second thing he did was it was a two-term semester where you calculate the two-term grade for the semester grade. And at the end of the term, and up until then, I didn't get Fs very often because I usually would bail myself at the last minute, do a little extra credit, save that C, you know? at any cost, and, um, and I, I was able to charm my well way on the most part of the teacher whispering, you know, yeah, go ahead and do this extra credit, and I'll get it up to a C. And Mr. Mungo uh, I, uh, called me to the front of his desk at the end of the first term, and he says, Henry, what do you see? And he has this calculator, he's calculating my grade, and he goes, what do you see? And I go, uh, Texas Instruments, Mr. Mungo. And he says, don't be funny right now, Henry. He goes, what do you see? And I go, it doesn't look good. Uh, I don't think I'm doing well. And he goes, no, you're flunking this term. I'm like, well, can I do some extra credit, you know, and bring that up? He goes, nope, no, nope, you can't. And I'm like, no. And he looks down, he's got his hand in his forehead like that, and just, and I, I was standing awkwardly staring at him because he was taking it so hard, you know, and, and I felt bad for him. And, uh, and then he looks up, and he says, Henry, I tell you what I'm gonna do. He says, I'm gonna give you an A, and I'm like, well, you gotta do what you gotta do, sir. <laughs> and he says, hold on a minute. He says, I'm gonna risk my job giving you an A. And I'm, I want you to earn an A next term and save my job. Oh my gosh. Next term, all of a sudden, I had a purpose and that was to save Mungo's job and I'm working on Fee Enterprise and I'm reading the chapters and I'm doing this thing and, and, and at the end of the term I nervously went up to his desk and I for him to calculate my grade and I go, what did we get? Calculates my grade and he goes, you got an A, Henry. And I was like, congratulations, sir, you can keep your job. <laughs> and I walked out of there and something happened that I didn't really understand the depth of it until later on in life when I at times felt like a failure. What he did was something we don't get in our natural environment or culture. We don't even get it in our schools and we don't even get it in our churches oftentimes. Because what, they were, what they're teaching us is that it's all about performance. See, we're afraid that those we love are gonna settle for mediocrity so we hold guilt over their heads. We make it about the grades. The, 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 the grading system a is perfect, B and C and D after that, nothing, right? You, you, you have to settle for a second best, third best, fourth best, 
fifth best. That's the kingdom of this world where if God were the, if the king of this world were a teacher, you would flunk. But he says we're part of the kingdom of God and they don't work on that same grading scale. Unfortunately, though, in this life, we hear things like bring your A game. <laughs> Got to bring your A game. You know, what is that? What is, what is the A game? You got to bring it. Don't, I, don't wanna, I don't want you to think that you, you can come in and not give your very best. Wear your Sunday best in church. Where's, I don't know if you're raised the way I was, but God deserves your Sunday best. It wasn't until I failed in this life that I realized God wasn't interested in my Sunday best. He wanted my Friday night worst. That was a shock that I can give him my Friday night worst because that's usually when I shut him out. That's when I usually shut out God who is the teacher that's not Mr. Mungo, that's someone else that says I fell short and so I isolate and then I have to numb the pain of the fact that I didn't meet up to my expectations or what I think somebody else's expectations are. And I learn to become self-conscious. I learn to take my cues by how other people uh, uh, think of me and the faces that they're making that I misinterpret. The idea that I'm not in this place and that place and I feel like it's just a little second place but then we learn, bring your A game. We're like, yeah, that's what I want to do. So I get on the internet and I read some, do some workshop on bringing your A game. And the A game is described in my notes somewhere and it's really cool. Oh, there it is. It says, bring your A game. This was what was written. It's not in yours yet, your notes, I don't believe. But bring your A game means, yeah, quit looking. Uh, so, is a common expression in athletics, which means to arrive with your top attitude and ability, because with today's competition, we're going to need it. In life, every day is game day. You simply can achieve your goals. You can't simply achieve your goals with a B-minus effort, which really sucks, because in college, every time I got a B and somebody else said they got a B, mine was a minus, and I'm like, I can't even get... Why the minus? Just make it a B. Doesn't that irritate you? You know? We're tolerating you, so we'll give you the B, but we're going to put a line at the end. All right? I am amazed at how many positive, important words for the job search begin with the letter A, and this person goes on to achievement, aptitude. And it goes on and on. The alpha male starts with A. Okay? There's another A word that can be associated with alpha male, but we won't say it in here. Because we just dedicated a child. <laughs> but the other word that we can lead to, and it was said in this line of A words, is appearance. Isn't that interesting? Is that, that's what brings you A game. If you're down and tired and frustrated and disappointed, at least give the appearance that you're not, because that will disappoint me. To community of the wild goose, we can come in that way, because it's about showing up even if you didn't dress out. It's about showing up even if you think, think you don't have it all together. Because we don't give clean slates here. We don't believe in the clean slates. See, the communion table, you can take communion, but if you think you're gonna get a clean slate, you're mistaken. Coming to the table and, and eating broken bread and grape juice from Safeway instead of wine <laughs> is our way of saying we're letting go of having to be whole and we're coming in our brokenness. And it's not that we're lowering the expectations, it's just that the God we love met our expectations greater than we could have ever done it ourselves. And it's about relationship. It's not about appearance. It's saying that I need this God to guide me through my inadequacies and insufficiency. That if apart from God I can do nothing, then how am I going to ever get to the place I thought I was supposed to be? That God is saying, do you not know that I've given you an A before you even set out on your studies? Because your journey is the unfolding and enlightenment and the awakening of the God who loves us in His perfection. The other description is uh, 
a, a player's best game, one usually brings his A game when the women are more attractive and therefore a greater challenge. That was actually written about the A game. Derived from the letter grade in school A. This term can also be used for other definitions of the game. I didn't get her number, so I didn't bring my A game. <laughs> Performance, comparisons. And then somebody says, she didn't even see your B or your C game, just so you know. <laughs> Better bring your A game for the Halo tournament. We hear that kind of, because we are, we, we, we want to win, so if it's a team game, bring your A game. What they're really saying is, I'm afraid I'm bringing my C game, so if you bring your A game, you got a ringer. We're dependent on how other people perform, too, when we're in that system, and it's disappointing. Bring your A game. It's about appearance so often. Well, what God has called us to is not the idea of bringing your A game, because you know what? I'm going to fail so many times, you guys. There's going to be times when I feel tired and inadequate. And I think I mentioned one time in here that I, I after three or four hours of sleep and I had just come back from out of town and I said I, I didn't feel like I had my A game and I probably sounded like you were getting a second class message of some kind. That's not what I interpreted back then. What I meant was I'm not feeling that good. Is that okay if I tell you guys? Because I'm still going to, I'm going to bring it, but it might not be very it-ish. <laughs> so you're on your own letting God speak through me and grab whatever you can, but we get to be real even if you are Pastor Henry or Padre Henry or Father Henry or Knucklehead Henry, you know, or Sister Henry. All right, I don't know. I've always wanted to be a nun. I don't know. No, no, so... Um, so in that, in that aspect of it, we come together as a community knowing that, because once we know that, then we understand the words of Thomas Merton when he says it is not something we can attain alone by intellectual effort, that is on your sheet, by the way, or by perfecting our natural powers, all right? This weekend, uh, my youngest son moved to LA, and I totally thought I was cool with it. I really did. I'm, I'm very much a last minute person. Everything happens last minute. Do reports last minute. Not because I want to, I really can't think until I have to. So prior to that, I, <laughs> it's, it's true. I, I try to, I will sit, my sister will tell you, we, we, we share a house together and I go, I'm gonna go to Starbucks and work on my message for Sunday. And then I come home an hour, hour and a half later, how'd it go? Nothing, <laughs> nothing, I got nothing. I don't think I've ever come back going, yay! It's all right there, you know? Just want to, yeah, I got nothing. And then it, boom, it hits. Last minute kind of thing, it starts happening. And I'm usually in the shower and I can't write it down, you know, and, and, and that aspect. But I've learned how to accept how I work and how I operate, you know? And, and so, um, so this, this weekend, I went to take Josh to, to LA and emotionally it was last minute too. I wasn't really grieving. And for those of you who kind of know my story, uh, when you lose a parent at a very young age, you grieve everything. Everything that leaves you, you grieve. Everything. You don't get the look you wanted, you grieve. They must hate me. Okay, a, a, a friend leaves town, and you don't know whether you really, they're a friend or you're in love with them. Honestly, you don't know the difference. And then they leave, and you feel like you got divorced, and you're sad or they die. Uh -huh. It's the orphan archetype. So I, I, I thought I was over the orphan archetype as a dad. And I'm getting my son, he's 28 years old. He's gonna go move to Andy's house in LA and I'm excited for him, I really am. And we're doing good. We're in Pasadena, we're eating food with Andy and her husband Perry, my two little granddaughters. And we're like, going good. And I said, hey, I need to head back, get back. Uh, this is yesterday, I gotta get back. And, and they're like, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I start to hug Perry goodbye, and I'm like, doggone it. Okay, my <laughs> son-in-law. Uh, bye, Miha, Andy, I'm, I'm hugging her. And I'm like, oh boy, this isn't good. You know, and, uh, and so then I'm leaving, and I did the thanks for being such a good sister to your brother kind of thing. And you say words like that, it's just like the levees are starting to open, you know? <laughs> and then Andy goes, 
and you should walk Dad out. And he goes, oh, yeah, I am. I'm like, oh! So Josh and I are walking down Main Street in Pasadena, cars all over the place. We go to say goodbye. We think we're really big guys, and you know, we're hugging each other, you know, and I'm holding him, and we're standing in the middle of the public square, two big guys hugging each other. <laughs> it works in California, you know. <laughs> Everything's cool. And uh, and then there's that awkward moment when you're like, what are people gonna think about? us showing affection in public, not think of another area. Just that affection, that intimacy in public is awkward, you know? We all feel that. Couples, married, whatever. Father and son, grown men, I'm hanging on, and then there's that feeling like you, you, probably, you probably should stop hugging now, it should be over. And I'm like, you know what, screw that. My hell of tighter. I love you, son. I love you too, Dad. I feel the heart just choking me in my neck. I'm really okay with it, Josh. I know you are, Dad. <laughs> I'm really excited for you, son. I, I know that, Dad. LA's not that far. It really isn't that far. I, I know that, Dad. <sighs> And then we relax. The moment that you feel like breaking the embrace in its awkwardness and you linger and you stay there is what God calls to us in saying, abide in me and I will abide in you. God, I don't think I'm deserving to be held this long by you. Shouldn't I get up and be responsible? Linger in the abiding nature that we have with God. That there isn't anything that needs to be done <coughs> to abide in Christ. That's the amazing thing about it, is that that's what we're being asked to do. If you don't, if you're a Bible person, well then go there and read about Mary and Martha. Who did Jesus prefer? The one that wasn't working, cleaning, and preparing for something. He was trying to say, the one who is sitting here looking irresponsible and just lavishing in the joy of my presence is, do like her, please. Not because he was criticizing her for cleaning and setting things up, but because he wanted to spend time with her, too, in this moment. There's plenty of time for that. Let's hang out. Yeah, but I'm just doing it because I love you. Hang out. Hang out. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. Listen to these scriptures now with that in mind. And when I read these, I want you to keep in mind that Jesus' usage of words and hyperbole, the over-the-top explanations, it sounds almost like there is a hell waiting for us if we don't do what he says. That we're going to burn in a lake of fire after our body dies on this earth and we're going to be in the worst case jacuzzi scenario you've ever heard of. Okay? It's flames instead of bubbles. Oh my God! So love one another. Okay! Alright. I love you, love you, love you, love you. I don't really love you, but I want to burn in hell. He must have meant something else when he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You're already clean because of the word. Listen to that sentence. He's trying to tell you you're already clean because of the word. What does that mean? The word. The Word is the aspect of that abiding, of that natural presence with God that can't be earned, that lingers in that moment on the curb in Pasadena where you say, the hell with it, I love you, man. And I'm going to stand and linger in this because this is more important and this intimacy is more important than anything we can ever experience or fill. I'm going to stay in that moment. That's the abiding aspect of it. That is the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word is God, and the Word was here before anything was. And so when we refer to the, uh, the, 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 uh, 
the Jesus become flesh aspect of the word became flesh and we have the word in us then we have the capacity to abide then we understand that in the urban dictionary when word meant word <laughs> it's like I want to go back to using that again word you know it, what that saying is I don't know what to say else I don't know I don't know what else to make of that it's just like I see what you're seeing word yeah word word and I love that because that's exactly what that means the word of God not the Bible of God not the words on paper from God not the words perfectly coming from his mouth but that sensation of presence and being and abiding in word did you see what I see the little drummer word you know, you stand out on a horizon or a vista and you see the, the landscape on the end of, of halfway through a hike or, or a rainbow that's from one end to the other. In Leadville, Colorado, I saw one of those. We were on the top of the mountain and there was a rainbow from one side to the other. Fifty high school kids get out of two vans after showering at the YMCA. Nobody said a word. We just walked out of the vans and stood there and stared at the rainbow. And it was as if we were all saying, word, 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 God, word, yeah. And God says back, word. That's how all things were created. Abide in me. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. We should remember that part. <laughs> He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. And now listen to this. If I were a Bible thumper, boy, I tell you what, I'd take an offering right after this one. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gathered them and cast them into the fire, and they are burnt. <laughs> Ushers bring the offering plates. Or they're going to hell. <laughs> When we are apart from God in our false self, it is though we are drying up. And it is though we feel separate. And it is though we are burning. Because our willpower and intention and aptitude and achievement and appearance is falling apart. Our image is going. And it is though I am burning in hell. Right? That's the... Is that what that means? Do they give refunds? Thought I paid my way into heaven. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Why? Because you're hanging with God and you know what is needed and you know what's going on and you have a chemistry about you. It's like being in love with somebody and having that chemistry and you finish each other's sandwiches. You know, I, that's from some movie. I heard, I don't remember what movie it was. You guys saw that movie? We finished both, we both finished each other's sandwiches. Oh! So, you have that feeling of word. Word. Okay? If you keep my commandments, oh, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Ab abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. See, the, the commandments are to be done the, the good works, the moral behavior is not to be done because of fear of hell. They're done because when we do the right things that we feel the sensation to do, it gives us the experience of heaven on earth. When I don't do the things and I'm running the show and I'm in charge, I feel hellish. No wonder. Let's get it off of the Bible thumping heaven and hell aspect of it. And, and look, AA calls it doing the next right thing. Right? Because if I go down the next wrong thing, that's a path that's going to lead to another wrong thing. What's the right thing to do right off the bat? Abide in me so I can remind you that you can't be perfect or good. That's the first right thing, is to abide in him. And then go back to that after every right move. Remember that you didn't earn anything by it. You abide in that. If you keep my commandments, you abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be full. 
This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than one day lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things I have heard from the Father I have made known to you. That idea that God calls us friends, that means the, tri the Trinity in its description is Father, we call God Father because he is for us. Jesus, because he walks alongside of us. The companionship of God and Holy Spirit because he is in us. And we'll close with this aspect of things with Thomas Merton on the back of your sheet there. And, and these are kind of heady things. All right, don't think, well, I can never really understand. Just take it home and, and sit in your abiding jacuzzi of God and read two or three words at a time and let this penetrate. It says, contemplation is more than a consideration. Okay, that moment on the curb, that's, that's contemplation. That moment of letting go and just not worrying about anything and showing that intimate love, okay? It's, it's playing golf when you've known the mechanics for a long time and then one minute you forget about the mechanics because you swung and it felt like you didn't even connect with the ball. It just takes off. Golfers will know what I'm saying. Okay? It's that, what? It, it's the feeling you get in that aspect. If it's the restful feeling you get when you're meditating and all of a sudden you don't want to stop for some reason. You can't decide whether you're asleep or you're awake. You're just comfortable in your skin. Okay, that's what we're talking about. So he says, uh, more even than, uh, it's, it's contemplation more than a consideration of abstract truths about God. More even than a affective meditation, that's the feelings we get it, on the things we believe. It is awakening enlightenment and the amazing intuitive grasp by which love gains certitude of God's creative and dynamic intervention in our daily life. See, we wanted God to intervene. We always want God to intervene. Change, but it's usually change this, move that, make that stop. Heal me from my feelings. We don't recognize that God is intervening in the familiar ways every day. We just have to open our eyes. That's the intervening God. Like I always say, he's not the, the love child of Santa Claus and a cosmic social worker. He is in us, with us, and about us. Working through our pain and our suffering. Hence, contemplation does not simply find a clear idea of God and confine him there as a prisoner to whom it can always return. On the contrary, contemplation is carried away by him into his own realm, his own mystery, his own freedom. It is a pure and virginal knowledge. And here's my favorite part. Poor in concepts. <laughs> I love that. What the heck? Poor in concepts? That just seems so irresponsible. You know why, just as a side note? It's because concepts never lead to experience. Experience is what leads to concepts, okay? Poor still in reasoning. Try to explain living in that moment, in that zone, in that freedom, in that understanding that God does really exist. Try to explain that to somebody and you'll feel foolish. Poor still in reasoning, but able by its very poverty and purity to follow the word wherever he may go. Word. Word. 